Okay, so we're talking about buoyancy and Archimedes' principle. This is one of the most famous stories about uh, buoyancy and its supposed uh, discovery by um, the Greek um, scientist and mathematician Archimedes. And the story goes like this. Um, a king was given a crown, and he wanted to know if it was made of real gold or not. So he asked Archimedes to test it out for him. And Archimedes came up with the idea of using the crown's uh, buoyancy to measure it. So the basic idea is here, if you were to weigh the scale or weigh the crown using a scale um, in air, um, you're going to find that it is, oops, um, the, the scale shows that it is um, 14.7 kilograms. So we, uh, and of course the, the weight would be 14.7 kilograms times G. But we'll just leave it in terms of the mass times G. So that's the, the mass of this crown. Now, if we submerge the crown in a fluid like water, and then we weigh it, well, then it only weighs 13.4 kilograms times G. So what accounts for the difference between the 14.7 and the 13.4? That difference comes from the buoyancy force. At the, at the top, there's a, a pressure acting down on the crown, but at the bottom, there's an even bigger pressure acting up on it. And that difference in pressure results in the buoyancy force. And the buoyancy force is equal to the, the mass of the fluid times gravity. So, that buoyancy force is equal to the difference between these two readings. So 14.7 minus 13.4 is 1.3. That is the buoyancy force acting up on this crown, which is equal to the um, mass of the fluid displaced by the crown times gravity. So if we um, compare that, um, the, the, uh, the, assuming that this fluid that we're using here is water, and the mass of water displaced by the crown is 1.3 kilograms, and the mass of the crown when we weighed it in air was 14 point seven kilograms um, so if we divide 14.7 by 1.3 that's going to give us the specific gravity so I mentioned earlier that specific gravity would come back up again and here it is so essentially what we're doing is we're comparing the mass of the object to the mass of the fluid it displaces the mass of the water and when we compare the mass of something to the mass of uh, water that the same amount of volume would displace, that gives us what we call specific gravity. And so 14.7 divided by 1.3 gives us a specific gravity of 11.3. Now, what has a specific gravity of 11.3? Well, unfortunately, it's not gold. Um, it turns out that 11.3 is the specific gravity of lead. So in this particular example, it looks like the king was cheated, and the crown, in fact, is not made of gold, but instead is made of lead. <clears throat> the story goes that um, when Archimedes came up with this plan, he uh, was in the bathtub himself. He was getting into the tub and saw the water level rising, the water that he displaced. It gave him the, this idea to test the crown. He jumped out of the tub and shouted, Eureka, which means I have found it, and ran through the streets. So um, that's the story of uh, Archimedes. So essentially, um, 
if an object is less dense than water or whatever fluid you happen to put it in, it will float. And um, part of it will um, stay above the surface of the water. If the object is more dense than water, then it simply sinks. <clears throat> And we can apply that same principle to air. So uh, we have here a question where we have a large balloon, and the balloon itself has some weight, and it's carrying um, this box that has some mass. And um, we might want to know uh, how much helium is required to uh, allow it to float. So this is how we would do that. So here's the question. We want to know the volume of helium to lift this balloon and its 180 kilogram uh, load that it's carrying. So this is 180 kilograms down here. Um, now keep in mind, the helium itself does have a weight. It is, um, if we look this up uh, in the textbook, the density of helium is 0.179 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so if uh, we wanted to know the mass, density is mass divided by volume, therefore mass is equal to density times volume. And so the buoyancy force um, is equal to the mass of the fluid displaced by the object. So the fluid in this case is the air that it's floating in. This giant spherical balloon is going to displace air and replace it with helium. And the buoyancy force that's going to be pushing up on it is equal to the mass of that air times gravity. Okay, so we have um, the mass of helium plus the 180 kilogram load acting down here times g is the total weight of this. So we've got the weight of the helium and the 180 we need, um, in order for this thing to float, we need the buoyancy force to be greater than the sum of those two things. So we've got the mass of the helium plus the 180 kilogram mass um, times gravity is going to have to be greater than the mass of air displaced by the balloon times gravity. Okay, and so um, we can find the mass of air by taking the density of air times its volume. So we're basically just substituting this in place of the mass of air. And again, we're substituting mass with density times volume. And um, okay. And then the gravity here will just cancel out of both of these sides. And so what we've got here is the the density of the air times the volume is equal to the density of the helium times its volume and those would be the, the same volume we're talking about the volume of this giant balloon plus 180 kilograms So we want to solve for um, V. So we've got the density of air times V. We'll subtract this term over to the other side. So minus density of helium times V equals 180. Factor out the V. So this is going to be equal to V. I'm sorry, not equals, but times density of air minus density of helium equals 180 and so the volume 
is going to equal 180. Then we'll divide uh, what's in the parentheses <coughs> over here to the other side to get density of air minus density of helium in the denominator. So the volume is going to be equal to 180 divided by 1.29 minus 0.179 and that equals 160 cubic meters. So that's how big the balloon would need to be in order to lift it and the 180 kilogram load off of the ground. Okay, so when air flows, or any fluid flows, it can flow in one of two ways. It can flow in a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. So a laminar flow, um, it flows in a smooth current. Um, but if that gets disrupted, all these little swirls and eddies form. This is known as turbulent flow. And basically, turbulent flow gets very complicated. As you can imagine, just graphically looking at this, it looks like a complicated mess compared to this. And so um, we're going to focus on laminar flow when we look at uh, doing some calculations when it comes to um, fluid flowing. So for laminar flow, if you just imagine the amount of fluid passing through a cylindrical pipe. Okay, if we take the area of the pipe multiplied by the velocity, how quickly it's going through there, uh, and then multiply that by the density of the fluid, that uh, product will equal the density 2 coming out times the area 2 times the velocity 2. Um, oftentimes if we uh, assume that the air or fluid is not being compressed, we can just drop that term out assuming that it's the same density going in as it is coming out and this um, equation can just simplify to area 1 velocity 1 equals area 2 2 velocity to. So uh, essentially what that means is if we reduce the area, so if we have a larger area going in versus a smaller area going out, that's going to increase the velocity. The velocity will go up if the area goes down. So if, if one goes up, the other has to come down. So if the area increases, the velocity decreases, if the area decreases, the velocity will increase. So like here, we have a, a reducer that's reducing the area. And you can see we have an initial V1 here, which is, you know, uh, only about a medium size. But then by reducing that area, we are going to increase that velocity. It's going to start traveling much uh, faster. The misconceptual thing that I want to clear up here though is that this does not increase the pressure. We're going to look at that in just a second here when we look at the Bernoulli equation. A lot of people think that by reducing cross-sectional area and increasing the velocity we actually increase the pressure and as a matter of fact that's the exact opposite of what happens. Fluid that is traveling at a higher velocity, when velocity goes up, pressure goes down. And we'll talk about that in the next video.